Hi, this is Ed Avila from AR15.com, and today I'm here with Corby from Fold AR. They make one of the most innovative products I've seen lately, and just like the name implies, it is a folding AR. So how did the Fold AR come to be? Well, I had seen the trends with uh, AR rifles, everybody wanting more compact, uh, wanting more concealability, and I've seen some manufacturers go about it in a way where they take the forearm or the upper uh, barrel off the um, upper receiver. And I didn't like the fact of having to disassemble the parts. I wanted the parts to stay together and not be able to bang up against each other when they're in a bag, being transported, uh, being able to get damaged, and I figured, you know, if it doesn't have a barrel nut, then you have the ability to fold the, at the barrel interface. So the design challenges that were uh, inherent in that is obviously you can't have a barrel nut. If you have a barrel nut, then it's not gonna work. I already overcame that when I designed the four bolt lockup system and years ago, actually. <coughs> and progress from there to come up with a way where the barrel extension could be folded around the corner into the upper receiver. The way that was accomplished was designing a self-releasing taper into the barrel extension and that allowed the barrel, not having a barrel nut, to be folded into the upper receiver and uh, being able to lock up consistently into the upper with that, again without needing a barrel nut. Now you still had the issue of a gas tube or a piston or something components. Yeah, so the gas tube went by the same concept that if they split apart right there and they have a male and a female cone that correspond to each other, when they come in and rotate in, they'll seal up as long as they meet together. So you basically have a tapered barrel extension and tapered bar gas tube within one half and then you have the female on the other half. Right. Now the product we're looking at today here is a Gen 2. Yes. What was your Gen 1 product? So this would be the Gen 1 product. I designed this in 2016 and um, this is made out of uh, 7075 but it's billet. So the machine time and just these primary chassis components, the upper and the forearm, uh, combined is about seven hours worth of machine time. And anybody making billet products knows that um, there's a lot of machine time involved and that's generally how you end up with a two to three thousand dollar rifle. Uh, <coughs> the primary difference other than being billet between Gen 2, obviously we went to, to M-Lock. Uh, these are key mods here in this Gen 1 and yeah, we have M locks in this Gen 2 product. Now, um, there's a couple other features that are different, like this, this lever. Initially, the design was to have a secondary latch where it would ensure that it didn't accidentally pop out on you, but after I uh, made a few of them and um, got to play around with them for the first time, determined that, hey, it cams over and there is no need for a secondary latch there, so I took that out. Um, but other than that, you got the design pretty good the first time around, huh? Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, there's, there's really not any significant de design changes. We use, um, we had fax and barrels in our Gen 1s, and we're manufacturing our own barrels now. Uh, with a third party and about to bring that in house. And now this Gen 2 here, <coughs> these Gen 2s are made from forgings and the upper is a forging and the forearm is a forging. So it allowed us to reduce our machine time down from se the initial seven hours to somewhere around, what was it, 38 minutes or so for a for a set. So now we're able to get the price down of the product. We're able to have a more consistent uh, machining process and um, 
the forging material is actually quite a bit stronger than uh, billet material. Now I notice when we close this upper onto the lower receiver that you have a very tight fit between upper and lower. There's absolutely no wiggle room. Mm -hmm. And that's another patented feature, correct? Yes. So if you notice on these, I've got two patent numbers etched in to the bottom of the upper receiver. So one of those patent numbers, the, the one that's really close to 10 million, I was banking on with my patent attorney to get 10 million, but uh, I lost that bet. That is for the folding firearm itself. The other patent number I got last year uh, covers what I call the shut feature. And uh, the shut feature is essentially two, two humps that are machined into the upper receiver right there at the bottom. And they protrude up, you can barely visually see it, but they protrude up about 15 thousandths. And when you lock the pin in, the, the pivot pin in to your lower receiver and you start squeezing that together, it puts a little bit of pressure right here on these two humps. And you'll notice a little gap and we'll demonstrate that, but you'll notice a little gap back here where the pin won't go in. So the key is to squeeze it down and you can pop that pin in and you'll notice after both takedown pins are in, there'll be no wobble between the upper and the lower assemblies. Now, one of the concerns with any sort of a takedown or any sort of a folding system is repeatability and accuracy when you take this thing apart, put it back together. Now, you've done some testing on this that has proven that to not be an issue, correct? Right. So, the, the first prototype I built was a 308 caliber. I figured if I can build it on the 308 caliber and it works, then we can definitely make it work with the 223 on the AR-15 uh, platform and 300 blackout calibers and so forth. So when I built the first prototype, the f first thing I wanted to do before investing a lot of money and time and effort into developing this as a consumer product was figuring out, is this thing going to return to zero? And I get that a lot of questions, especially technically minded people that are thinking about how these pieces fit together, being that the barrel is not uh, traditionally connected to the uh, upper receiver with a barrel nut. When this thing gets folded over and shot and warms up and gets latched and unlatched over and over and over, is the barrel still in alignment with where you had your crosshairs, which are, is rigidly attached to your upper receiver through your scope. So when I built the 308, that was the very first thing I tested. and. Like I said before, dumping a lot of money and time into developing a consumer uh, grade product, I had, I had to get empirical evidence of what is a repeatability. So took the 308 out, sighted it in, shot it, came back a couple weeks later, did not move the adjustments on the crosshairs, unfolded it, you know, temperatures are changing, we're in that fall period where it's still hot and then cold. So notice that 100 yards at least, I didn't have to adjust the crosshairs. It was still hitting, you know, right on within a half an inch of where uh, I initially sighted it in. So I kept doing that over the course of a few months and, you know, obviously by the third, fourth time out, I knew that this thing was gonna, gonna perform like I needed to. So I immediately started moving into developing the AR-15 platform and even improving upon my prototype, the way I machine things and the tolerances in that folding interface, the pivot pin and the cones that correspond there, I improved my manufacturing processes even beyond that. And uh, now with these products, I have a very consistent uh, way to manufacture the interface. So there's nothing proprietary though about this upper going on to another lower. This will fit on anybody's lower that has an existing lower, correct? I would say any lower that's designed around mil-spec uh, mil standards. Uh, so there's obviously some manufacturers that deviate from that, but if it's a mil-spec lower, then yes, it's designed to fit that. So you can buy today, you can buy a complete upper that folds in half and I can put that on my lower that I already have. But if I want, I can also adapt my lower to fold the stock itself. Right. 
Um, and here's the system with a double fold. So not only do I have the folding upper receiver, but I also have a folding stock in the lower receiver extension, correct? Yes. So this product right here on the stock end is a product by Deadfoot Arms and they call it their MCS, Modified Cyclic System. And the reason they call that is that they do modify the bolt carrier group to make it shorter so that the full action can take place in a shorter distance rather than having a long buffer tube out here. It, it works really well. You can fire it folded just like that. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest advantages this system has over other types of folding adapters is that it can be uh, fired folded. <clears throat> now while we're talking about that, a concern that anybody would have is if you were to fold your upper receiver and somehow not latch this or miss the latch, does that create a problem? Right, so surprisingly few people have expressed a concern about that. There have been some and that was my second question when I built the 308 prototypes, was naturally somebody is going to miss the hook or get it out of their package when they buy it and not really know how to engage it properly. Or think they got it and it's or, just yeah, hanging or, loose. Or think they have it latched like, here it looks like it's latched, but it's really not. And um, a, a few a few people have actually taken the rifle out and, and shot it just like that, I've seen on some videos. So, going back to my 308 prototypes, when I made the prototypes, I wanted to know, is this a safety concern? Obviously, if it's a safety concern and this thing blows up when somebody fails to engage it, then this is not a product we're uh, putting out in the marketplace uh, for the liability factor and just the fact that somebody could get hurt. So again, 308, after I pro uh, had proven out the point of impact um, or the return to zero, if you want to call it that, the second, the second criteria was determining is this thing safe if somebody doesn't get that latch engaged properly. So unlatched it, loaded one in the chamber, well, loaded one in the chamber and then unlatched it. Um, put it in a put it in a bench. Put a string on the trigger. Stood back. Pulled the trigger and it just fired. Pulled the trigger again. Fired. Pulled the trigger again. Fired. Um, went through half a magazine and started thinking about it. And once you do think about the mechanics behind it, you know that the firing pressures take place between the lugs of the bolt and the lugs of the extension. And of course the whole barrel sees pressure, but all the dangerous pressures are coming through the lugs. None of the dangerous pressures come through, if it was a standard AR, the barrel nut, which holds the barrel onto the barrel, onto the upper rather. So after I had thought about that, it came to me that your dangerous pressures are not propagating through through the outside of these components. The only thing that is propagating through here is the tension that's actually squeezing the barrel onto the upper. When this thing's fired, those stresses stay in the bolt extension, the barrel, or the bolt lugs, the extension lugs in the barrel. So, it made sense why nothing happened. And of course, we went out with Teeks and they verified it under controlled conditions and um, under supervision and, and uh, safety equipment and processes that were to keep people safe and same thing happened. Stood back, put it in a bench, put a string on it even though I knew what was gonna happen. Fired the whole magazine through it. And it just keeps firing. So, long story short, I'm comfortable with it. I mean, we're putting our name behind it, and um, once you once you think about how the pressures operate inside there, it's easy to conclude that um, it, it remains safe. 
So there's no gray area of it being semi-latched or unlatched completely. If that bolt is engaged into the extension, only then can your firing pin hit the primer. And if it's engaged, your pressures are going through your bolt and extension. And as long as your bolt and extension are sound, then um, all the rest of it is, is safe. Now, one of the other features that I noticed was that when I latch the upper receiver together, it's very difficult to open the latch with your bare hands. Yeah, yeah. So I designed the lever not to be disengaged manually because if I was to do that, then it would increase the chance of it inadvertently coming disengaged and not so much for safety reasons because we just talked about it's still safe to shoot even if it becomes disengaged, but if you're in a stressful environment, you don't want, you, you want to always know that it's engaged and that the barrel is fixed to the, you know, to the upper receiver. So I designed it to where it'll be disen disengaged with the backside of a case, designed it specifically for an AR-15 or a you know, platform bullet, a 223 or 300 blackout or any, any other cartridge will fit right inside there and you hook the back end of the rim under that lever and pry it up. So once you get past that point, then it can be opened by hand. A lot of people have said, well, why don't you just design it where there's some pins coming out to where you can just put your fingers under it and pull it open and this goes back to the same thing. You're walking through the woods or you're in some kind of stressful situation. You don't want anything to catch on that and open it up. And that, that's why it's designed like that. Plus that camming force is really what keeps that shut. Yeah, and it's, it's quite a bit of force. Once you close it in there, uh, I've been able to do some of them with my finger, get my finger in there, but you're really close to breaking your finger. Excellent. So you mentioned the product is available in 223, which you're doing a 223 wild chamber, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. Which means any 223 or 556 NATO right. will work, and then a 300 blackout. Yes. And in various barrel lengths as well, you have pistol offerings and rifle offerings. So as you mentioned, we've got the 223 wild caliber and 300 blackout in our main configurations. And I'll start down here and go down the, down the line here. So this is the nine inch version. And the reason I designed a nine inch is as you can see, when you fold it up twice, uh, your end of your barrel basically comes flush with the end of the upper receiver on this dead foot arms MCS part here. So obviously if you increase your barrel length, this end starts growing down, but nothing up here is changing. So there's really no reason to put anything longer than a nine inch here and keep it in a double folding configuration. And there's really no reason to make it shorter either, because then you're just moving back sure. here and not gaining anything. So this is a, this is a good configuration, a nine inch on the double is is ideal so i'll move on to 14 and a half inch the reason i did a 14 and a half i jumped up from nine to 14 and a half i guess there's two reasons one is that if it's on a pistol configuration stock like this it, it's pretty close to being folded in half of course, that depends on what kind of muzzle device you put on there. The barrel actually just comes to about right there, but you could have a muzzle device that's that long or shorter. Um, other reason, if you did put it on a rifle stock then and you wanted to SBR it, you could SBR it, but a lot of guys like the pin and welded, take it to their gunsmith get a 14 and a half, put it on a rifle stock. Rifle stock comes out to about right there and uh, they just pin and weld it. So that's been pretty popular. I, I believe that this configuration right here will end up being one of the most popular configurations to get a little bit more bang and not have to triple up on your, on your width and you're still 
Very compact. Fits in a backpack, fits in your truck. Still the most compact other than other than the double. This is still the most compact, fully assembled AR there is. So this is the 16 inch version here. As you can see, it's on a rifle stock and uh, it, it does come out more than halfway. Of course, with the adjustable stock, you could make it halfway if you wanted. But this will keep you out of NFA territory and is pretty common. Still folds approximately in half and still your limiting factor is your barrel length. So aside from these two products, this is the most compact uh, fully assembled AR there is. So full power AR-15 in 223 or in 300 blackout in essentially 16 inches. Yep. It ends up being, it ends up being about 17 and three quarters from the end of the muzzle device to the end of the barrel extension. Of course, the barrel is me measured from the breech, which starts about this level here and goes to the tip of the barrel somewhere in there. So that's, so from here to here is 16 inches. Now, what are some of your storage or transportation capabilities here? So this is a Pelican Air 1525 case. Okay. And I designed, I designed some foam inserts for different configurations. You've seen the three configurations here, and I have a case for each one of those. But this 1525 case will fit all of our products. And some of the things I've designed here, you see all these holes, those are obviously just for bullets. Uh, there's a compartment for a range finder. Now that's designed for the SIG series of range finders. This compartment here is for a Kestrel. Uh, this compartment here is for a spare parts kit. Uh, compartments for a bore lube and solvent. These these compartments here for one, two, three batteries. This is another spare parts or cleaning kit compartment. This right here is for a suppressor. And like I said, this, this foam cut out, this can be removed. This back end right here is pre-cut to where you can remove it and fit a rifle stock or the double folding stock would fit back in there. So this is a pretty versatile case here. It's a little bit large for the uh, double folder, but uh, overall it, it serves a good purpose in keeping the folded firearm protected and uh, in, a, in a good small transportation case. So for those of us with a double fold AR, a small pistol, what's a compact bag you can use to carry that? I recommend the NC Star uh, First Responders Pack. And I've got a double in this one right here. That's a bag you can carry anywhere. Nobody's going to suspect you have an AR-15 in there. Right. That's ready to go. Very impressive. Thanks for watching, and we're going to head to the range.